Welcome to the next episode of The Axe Academy, an online community and platform for the Christian millennial who wants to make their life count. We sharpen your life in seven areas, and like we always say, let's keep swinging away. Leadership, what is it? I mean, what makes a good leader? Followers, impact, maybe historical significance, influence, you know, personal style, wealth. I mean, by those metrics and those sort of measurables, then Hitler, by that definition, was a good leader. Is good then subjective? I mean, what makes a good leader? What's the best kind of leadership or way to lead? What are some myths of leadership? What makes a leader good? Let's talk about that. I'll give you three qualities of a leader who is good and one style above the rest. I am so excited what's going on at the Axe Academy right now. Make sure that you check out this month's Axe course on value-based versus rule-based parenting. Now, if you haven't taken one of the free Axe courses that we offer, we actually offered a new one, one on Static Jedi and one on the Six Creative Mountains. You can choose which path you like to make. Coming shortly, there's going to be a path to an axe, reading plan, axe courses, and simply amazement, where you actually earn an axe. Hey, please keep sharing this with someone. We're kind of in a crucial spot in this individualistic society. You know, don't assume our success. We need your help to get to our goals. You know, could we borrow your social media platform for maybe a post or two? Would you consider supporting it? If you're a leader of a church, we're really looking for 500 churches at 100 bucks a year, and then Axe Academy could just simply be free. What is leadership? The action of leading a group of people or an organization. You know, that's the fancy definition. Guidance, direction, control. They even listed management, superintendents. I like that word. Supervision, more organization, government, all of the thoughts around leadership. Defined as the state of position of being a leader, the leader of a party. Even gets into dictatorship or governorship or governance, administration, control, ascendancy, supremacy, rule, command, power, dominion, influence. I mean, at the core, what is leadership? You ask 10 different people, you might just get 10 different answers. You look up the one word leadership and you have a plethora of styles and ways that even Webster's Dictionary is describing leadership. I think leadership at its foundation is just simply influence. At the very foundation of what leadership is, we find a force, influence. So right from the foundation of leadership, we can see a paradox. Influence. Well, the influence paradox. I mean, you've heard it said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. I would maybe just add, Jesus was a friend of sinners and he saved the world from sin. But here, when we're talking about influence, uh, there's a paradox. There's good influence and there's poor influence. There's influence that shapes us in a way that erodes us, that degrades us. There's influence that shapes us in a way that builds us or actually adds to us. So it's all about influence. Can anyone be a leader? Yes. I mean, you already are a leader. You're leading yourself every day when you get up and you don't work out. I've been there. Uh, you're leading yourself when you do what you set out to do or you set out to not do what you want to do. I mean, you're leading even yourself. You're leading others. Now, those ways that you're leading others in influence, there is size, there is scope, but your leadership even to yourself and to the others around you at whatever scale you want to measure it with, that has fruit. And that fruit of your leadership will bear a title, it'll bear authority, position, scope, and maybe even more influence. Which really begs the question, what makes a good leader? I mean, is it the followers? Let's just think about that for a second. How many people, when you meet someone, uh, have looked at how many followers you have on X, Y, or Z social media accounts and then determined that you're not leading anyone? I mean, I'm guilty of it. There's been those moments where I've heard someone speaking at an event and then I look and see sort of that one measurable 
and then I realize, wow, this person has something to say, or wow, this person really needs to take better pictures of their dessert. I mean, let's think about that for a second. Do we measure it with followers? I think in this social media landscape that's so hypervigilant to get likes and shares and posts, let's be honest, we see that as a measurable. Uh, it, it all comes down to wanting more impact. So is it the followers that makes a good leader or the size of them? Uh, is it the impact that they have? Uh, maybe it's the historical significance. When we look back on their life, it was a legacy and they left awake. Uh, it was like that proverbial Steve Jobs quote, you know, I want to live a life so I leave a dent in the universe. Is that the historical significance that measures the success? Again, is it influence? Is it the powerful way that you use whatever it is that you have to influence others? Is it personal style? Is it about branding? Is it about wealth, like the houses or the things that you accumulate or the titles that you have? I'll just simply say, if those are the measurables of what makes a good leader, then by that definition, Hitler was a good leader. I mean, Hitler had a lot of followers. Hitler had a huge impact. Hitler had historical significance. Hitler clearly had influence. Hitler had a personal style, to which, I'll just be honest, I'm not really digging the Charlie Chapman mustache, nor can I hardly grow a mustache. I can hardly grow eyebrows. Moving on. I mean, Hitler acquired, obviously, a lot of wealth. And in that, there was a fallout for all of that. Some of the most historically understated moments of basically the last 100 years we we see the weight of his leadership. We feel the weight of his leadership. Good is then subjective. If Hitler was a good leader, good becomes a subjective term. You know, a subjectivity of values or a subjectivity of good. Now, track with me just for a second because Bernard Russell says, the theory which I have been advocating is a form of the doctrine which is called the subjectivity of values. He's basically saying that good or values are subjective, or they're relative in a sense. This doctrine consists of it maintaining that if two men differ about values, it is not a disagreement to any kind of truth, but a difference in taste. If one man says oysters are good and another says they're bad, like if somebody likes Burger King and somebody likes McDonald's, we recognize that there's nothing really to argue about. The theory in question says all the differences to values are of this sort, although we do not naturally look to them or think of them when we're dealing with matters that seem to bring us more exalted than oysters or cheeseburgers. I mean, he's basically saying that the disagreements that we have is not about good, but it's about taste. I would just simply argue good is not subjective. Good is objective. Good is something that has been revealed. Good is something that can be seen. Good is something that can be measured. The morality of good. I mean, C.S. Lewis talks about this at length in Mere Christianity. And if you haven't read it, it's one of the books that you will have to read on your path to an ax. There is a universal moral law. There is a universal moral law and there is a moral law giver. If there's a moral law giver, there must be something beyond this whole thing called the universe. Therefore, C.S. concludes, there's something beyond the universe. A good leader does not make that leader good. It is possible to be a good leader from some measurables without being a good person or a leader that is good. So there has to be a different construct by which we measure leadership. How do we become a leader that is good? What is the best kind of leader? What makes a leader good? And does not define good leader based on those toxic metrics. What is it? First, sometimes I think it's helpful to figure out what something is not before we discuss what it is. Xavier, my son, has got this little box, this little Star Wars, like 20 questions box. And you think of a Star Wars character, and then it asks you a number of questions. And by the end of the 20 questions, it's going to guess which character, which planet, which 
Star Wars icon you're thinking of in your mind. It does this by deductive reasoning, really finding out along the way what it is not before it can tell you what it is. So let's start there. Leadership is not management. Management in any setting is the production of an acceptance of some sort of result within known constructs and conditions. Leadership is not about title and order or control. Leadership is not a quest for fame, attention, power, or money. I think what leadership is not really brings us to what leadership is. First, a couple myths of leadership. I was listening to my friend Micah McDonald share at a conference that we were speaking at together, and I thought these were pretty great. So I pulled just a couple of them out to share with you. The first myth is leaders are loud and charismatic. I would agree. Wrong. One of the greatest female leaders to walk this earth was a quiet soul. Her name was Mother Teresa. I can't wait to share with you the hero monologues that I did at a recent uh, conference called Exponential. It was a blast. That's all I can say. Stay tuned. Uh, leaders have degrees and doctorates. Wrong. I mean, the disciples, just even the disciples, as one example, uh, the Bible says they were ordinary, untrained, unschooled men. Not that it's bad to be schooled. I'm actually finishing a master's degree uh, right now, and then I'm going to get another one. But here we are. This is a leadership myth. Leaders are those who have a million followers and the biggest influence. Uh, wrong. I say this uh, often when I'm preaching, especially when I'm looking uh, for people to understand this point, is how many followers did Jesus have? Twelve. Uh, if you looked at Jesus' Twitter account, you'd be like, what is going on here? This guy's going to change the world. And actually, he had 11. Somebody unfollowed him. He knows the pain that you feel when you're unfollowed. And then he had 12 again. Leaders are older than me. I mean, leaders, they're not young. That's a myth. You, honestly, if you're under, let's just simply say 45, so that includes me, we're really young. I'm kidding. If you're under 60, no. If you're, the honest to goodness truth is corporations are literally looking at the next generation because you will shape and influence culture and they want to meet you there so you can continue to consume what they have. So what makes a good leader? All this in this moment. Let me just give you the three qualities of a leader who is good. We talked a little bit about the paradox, a little bit about the question of even what is leadership? What makes a good leader? Can anyone really lead? We talked a little bit about what leadership is not. And now let me give you the three keys or maybe three attributes what I think makes a leader good. First, you must be a servant leader. This is what a true leader is. They want to sacrifice themselves for the good of others, even if there will be no return on their investment. It's this idea that when people choose leadership for any other reason than to die to themselves, they become bored, they become distracted, and they honestly leave. I mean, if you're leading for ourself or yourself, you're going to leave a trail or a wake of brokenness behind you. Your own legacy is too small a thing to live for. This is really why I even started the X Academy, because it's not about me. This last conference I was at, at Exponential in Orlando, the whole thing was called Hero Maker. It's all about making heroes of others. And really, that was a characteristic or a trait that stuck with me the most, because I think good leaders or a leader who is good, rather more succinctly stated, is just simply someone who makes heroes, someone who is a servant leader. I mean, the real payoff for leaders is others. Uh, one sticking point that I've noticed in this is when it comes to your ideas. Like if you're a servant leader and you have an idea, you want your idea or your vision to be executed, uh, I just simply say there's a difference between ideas and vision. And vision and values, those things you want to be married to. 
the thing that is moving you towards the direction that you're going. The purpose, mission, and vision, you want to be married to that. But you want to be just friends with your ideas or the execution of that mission, vision, and purpose. You'll leave room for other people's ideas, for other people's perspectives in this whole journey where you're going together in whatever organization you're in. The second key that makes a leader good is you must be a transparent leader. When we fail to embrace, like vulnerability, we lose trust with the people that we lead. You know, when we fail to embrace this transparency, I think people have a hard time trusting us. When you never show the chink in your armor, it's, uh, it's like you're made out of armor. Uh, I don't think you can be too vulnerable as a leader, but I do think you need to be tasteful as a leader. But people will always want to know what you're learning versus what you know that you've learned. They'll want to know where you're at versus where you've been. I mean, true leaders can really say, I stink at something. I need some help in here or in this area. I would just simply say, if you want to be a leader who is good, you must be a servant leader, but you also must be a transparent leader. So be vulnerable about the challenges that you face with those that you're leading. The third key or attribute of a leader who's good It's just simply this. You must be a leader learner. If you're not willing to develop as a leader, then you're not worthy of leading. I mean, I try and welcome input and leadership into my life. I mean, do you have this coachable perspective or spirit? I mean, we're always critiqued, by the way. What makes us think that we're not going to be critiqued in leadership or in anything that we put our hands to do? And if you are okay with that, a leader is always going to be hungry for improvement. Never lose the teachability. Never lose that learning spirit. Learn something from everyone, but always keep learning as you lead. I mean, be less worried about making mistakes along the way than playing it safe and sitting on the shore. I mean, failure is necessary. It's not just, it's not evil, but it is necessary for you to grow. If you haven't failed as a leader, uh, then you're really maybe just playing it too safe. You're not in the deep water you need to go into. Obedience and sacrifice will always fulfill vision and precede promotion in our lives. It's that private discipline that almost always leads to some sort of promotion. It's that private discipline that gives you a public voice. That private discipline leaves you being a voice, not an echo in this world. And by the way, with your peers, with people that you're leading side by side, or maybe even uh, underneath you in a corporate hierarchical structure, uh, I'll just simply say one point of advice is you don't have to know it all. Invite perspectives and you'll have perspective. One thing I would encourage you to do is even if you know the answer, still ask the question. Let someone else talk and learn from them. They might have a perspective, you don't. You invite that perspective, you'll have perspective. Now, in the Extended Acts episode, if you're an Acts subscriber, we're gonna talk through nine types of leadership styles. Uh, And we're gonna actually focus on one, servant leadership, really to unpack because it was the way of the Christ. Servant leadership out of those nine styles does two things that I want to talk a little bit more in detail with my ACT students or supporters about. Number one, it gets us under versus over people. And number two, it's more about becoming than doing. Hey, if you're not a student or a supporter of the ACTS Academy, make sure you use the code SWINGAWAY10 and get your first month on me. As we always say at the ACTS Academy, keep sharpening your ACTS in those seven areas so you can build and blaze what you're supposed to do. Keep swinging away.